I'm Drew McWaney, and we're here for HitFix.com at the Sundance 2011 Film Festival. And I'm with Evan Glodell. And would you introduce yourself as well? Yes, uh, Tyler Dawson. And these are the stars of Bellflower, a movie that I saw that's part of the next selection here at the festival, and that, to put it bluntly, I flipped for. So <laughs> we wanted to sit down with the guys today and talk about the journey that it took to get this incredibly unusual film to the screen. Not only does the film have a great handmade aesthetic in terms of what's going on in front of the camera, but it's even even in terms of the lenses and sort of the way you shoot, the, the idea that there's dirt collected on the lens oh, yeah, while you're yeah. shooting, it gives it this, this really wonderful, dusty, sort of found feeling. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and so you actually built camera equipment for the film. Yes, I mean, it's, it's we call it cameras because they look like cameras and they're big, but they're really, they're, we're using the sensor and the all the recording stuff from other people's cameras. We, we shot in the SI2K, mm -hmm. um, and, then, uh, and then all the optics are stuff that I built. I would be impressed enough on that level, but uh, then in terms of the performance, um, again, I, I really feel like it's such a natural, um, relaxed performance uh, that I, I find it hard to believe you did double duty or oh, quadruple duty uh, on the film. I think I, I, for that, I, I, a lot of the time, I felt like I was just there, just like <laughs> sitting there and letting everybody else do stuff, but, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I also had like six years or something to obsess in my mind over the thing and think about it and like yeah, we had all worked together a lot before so we were really comfortable and uh, yeah. it definitely helped the performances well even the shooting schedule was it was a prolonged because I, I love the notion that you just finally said nobody's going to give us the money to do the whole thing up yeah. front we have to start which I truly believe you have to do at some point and then yeah. it becomes a snowball yeah. um, so how long did it take you from when you said that to actually what you consider the wrap of the film a couple of two years maybe yeah. well we started most of principal photography in the summer of 2008 so we did a couple of chunks there and and um, and then over the next two years we were doing pickup shots and stuff and then but I had originally met Evan close to seven years ago to make this movie Wow but it didn't actually get made for about five or six years so yeah uh, but and then in that time yeah we worked on a lot of projects together and it sort of collected our little band you know, a little... It's a real act of faith, though, when you're shooting something over that period of time, that there will be a finish line. And, uh... Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, it is. <laughs> what kept you moving forward on it once you had started production? Was it the things that you saw coming in? Was oh, it the, the footage that you actually had that motivated I'll, you? Uh, I have an answer. Hopefully no one thinks I'm crazy for saying this, but there's a very definite answer. I, I, I wanted to make this movie since I first wrote it uh, in, like, 2003 or 2004. And I'd been trying to figure out how to like get it going, and it was, wasn't ever coming together. And at some point, I feel like I felt I fell so far off the path of what I wanted to be doing. I got like insanely depressed, and I was like, "Holy shit! Like if I don't move back to what I think I'm supposed to be doing, I'm something like terrible is going to happen." Right. And so it, that got so dark at one point. That was when I sort of pulled the trigger and was like, "We, we got to do this," and uh, and I, that kind of stuck with me. So the idea of not finishing or failing almost like equal equals. Something bad. Something bad. So <laughs> it's it's a great blend of tone, and uh -huh. I, I always think tone is one of the hardest things for a filmmaker, especially a first-time filmmaker, uh -huh. to get a handle on. Can you talk about kind of how you guys all set the tone for what you were doing and found that blend between uneasy comedy and genuine darkness in the picture? C c casting him helped. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Uh, and then I, I know it's almost like the, the mood of the movie, I think, was almost like, for me, like the stuff that I obsess over, it was like, the, the mood of it is almost like that's what it was for me. So so I think about these different sections, I'm just like, I'm like oh my god, this movie is so incredible, it's this weird like mood and stuff. So that's, that definitely was a focus point for me, so it's good that it came across. I find it, it's, it, one of the things I love is I find it hard to believe that I can, in the same movie, see a sequence as sweet as that road trip, and as gentle as that road trip, and then the apocalyptic ending of this picture. Oh. And for one film to kind of take me on that ride um, is exactly what you want from a, mo a movie that yeah. kind of pushes a, a, an envelope like this. Yeah. That, that, that was, the intention was definitely that. From the start of the movie, we're like, the first half is going to be like this like beautiful, like happy thing. And then, in, it, it, like, and then the second half, it was going to go insane. <laughs> and I know that, well, I'm sure all of us have talked about it a bunch of times. We're like, oh, we hope people go. We hope people go with yeah, it. Yeah, we weren't sure if it was going to translate fully. Yeah. Because it's so light and fun at the beginning of the movie and then has such a change by the end. And Yeah. So And, and as far as the mood on set and stuff, I don't know, as a performer in it, like, often... It was under such strenuous circumstances that, I don't know, it helped the mood of the film in a lot of ways, or our performances, and uh, just helped, yeah, helped it be what it became, yeah. The setting, Bellflower Avenue, and that part of Los Angeles, um, it's, it's 
really beautiful the way you captured it, and it's not a part of LA that I would call necessarily beautiful. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, was that something that was the was the location important to you? Uh, because obviously, yes, the title is that, but but was that from the very beginning something that was important to you? Yes, it was very important. Um, that's where I was living, off right off of Bellflower. It's like this one section of Bellflower. It's about two blocks long. It dead ends on both ends, and that's where I was living when. The things that happened that sort of inspired the movie uh, went down. So a lot of things in my real life kind of, I had some terrible, late, drunken nights, fights, <laughs> horrible stuff, and on this, all seemed to happen on the street. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, so that, we, we didn't figure out the name right away. I was having a hard time with the name, and then later on, I kind of was like, went, went back to the neighborhood. And I was like, this is the neighborhood where it's all supposed to happen. And walked around, and I saw the sign, I was like, Bellflower, it, it sounds like, it sounds like it, Mean something cool, you know. Well, even the even the title is deceptively pretty at first, you know, yeah, and yeah. then once you get into the ride, you just have no idea where you're going. And again, that I love that. I love the fact that narratively you don't adhere to any simple formula, and the film completely takes you on left turns repeatedly. Uh huh. Um, that seems like uh, it, it, it seems very organic in the picture, but it can't have been easy in terms of you developing the script over the years. Uh, I put great faith in the creative process mm -hmm. that if you just work on something even if you don't know what you're doing you just keep working on it it, it sort of shows itself to you and I had a, a lot of times do that well what an unlikely muse in Lord Humongous to oh, end up having yeah, in the film yeah. and, I, and I gotta say I have never been more shocked than to see a Lord Humongous quote at the beginning of a movie oh, yeah. um, never a guy I would expect to see quoted anywhere oh, yeah. uh, and what is the quote that you guys use actually uh, it's, it, oh that's a good question it's actually not a real quote okay. I made it up it says Lord Humongous cannot be defied that's... and it actually sums up the entire meaning of the whole movie to me yeah uh, now do you have people arguing with you about uh, arguing about the meaning of the ending because I, I what I love is that I know what I think you've uh -huh. said at the ending of the film and I know which choice I hope you made yeah. <laughs> but I don't know which choice you made. And that's yeah. kind of the place that I like being left. Yeah. Um, is that something that audiences have embraced? Um, they definitely ask about it. It's been it. talked about yeah, a lot, yeah. It's talked about a lot. And I think it's just up to interpretation, mostly. You know, we like people to decide what it means for them and decide how it affects them and what, you know, yeah. what it sparks. You know, we want people to leave thinking and, you know, yeah. so. It's, 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 it's interesting because I definitely have a way that I think it is. I don't know how much that matters. But we found that if it gets clarified too much, the movie actually doesn't work. So I would agree. I think yeah. I, I, and I hope whatever distributor ends up working with you on this, I hope they respect the fact really that that so needs too. to be <laughs> as ambiguous as it is. Yeah. Um, well, listen, I, I want to thank you for taking the time, and I really hope that uh, my readers and, and the larger viewership gets a chance to see the movie very soon. Yes, we do thank too. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, man. All right, Take awesome, care. Dude.